So for today's class, I've gone back and forth three or four times on what I want to call this lecture. Like it was originally, I think, just all to be indexes, lat tree data structures. Then I switched it to B plus tree data structures. And then as of last night, I said, let's call it whole key data structures. And that'll make more, se more sense in, in a few more slides. Um, but the main idea here is just like, we're just talking about what kind of indexes or data structures we could build or use for doing, for all to be workloads. The, other thing that I forgot to mention on Piazza, uh, because they were late on giving me the information, um, there actually is a, uh, a visitor today from Snowflake coming to give a talk at 4.30 on uh, the query optimizer in Snowflake. Snowflake is a, one of the biggest sort of OLAP cloud uh, database vendors, database as a service. Our competitor would be something like Google's BigQuery or Amazon's Redshift. Um, and so Bowe is actually a former student of mine here at CMU. He took 721 like you guys, started working in the query optimizer. People could not hire him fast enough. Uh, so he's, he's been at Snowflake for two years now and he loves it. So he'll give a talk today about the kind of stuff they're doing in the query optimizer at, at 430. So by all means, please, please come to this and I'll, I'll send a reminder on Piazza, okay? Everyone's invited. Uh, Bowe, I think there's a, some recruiting event on campus this week. I, I forget why he's here. What's tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Is, what's that? Okay, so he's here for that. But like I said, if you take this class, many ways, the things that you'll learn from this will help you get you know, past the interviews of these various data with companies. Uh, and so Boe can tell you whether that's true or not because he's been at you know he's been at some of it for a while. Okay. All right. So as I said at the beginning, I debated back and forth what I want to call this lecture, um, and whole key is kind of not exactly true, but the main thing I wanna, I'm trying to distinguish is the things we'll talk about today versus what we're gonna talk about on, on Wednesday's class. So this is also in quotes, because this is my term. I don't think this is actually what, this is not standard, standard vernacular. Um, I don't know what they say in information theory, uh, but this is, this is what I'm using just to sort of again, contrast the two. By whole key, I mean that we're gonna have a data structure where it's gonna be order preserving, so we wanna make sure we can keep track of you know, whether one key is less than another key, and that we're gonna store all the digits of that key together in the various parts of, of, of its representation inside of the, of, the, of the data structure. So what I mean by that is if I have a key ABC, I could have in, in my leaf node, I could have key, key ABC together. And now if I wanna do comparison to see whether my key is less than or greater than or equal to that given key, I, I have all the contents of the key right there. That's not entirely true when you start doing uh, some compression techniques, but for our purposes today, we can assume that's the case, right? And then on, uh, on Wednesday's class, we'll talk about what are called partial key data structures, or tries, where you actually break up the digits of a key and store them separately inside the nodes inside the data structure, right? And so one way to think about this is like, uh, with this approach, um, sorry, with this approach, you, you, the partial key, like you may have to do less work to find whether something actually matches. You may have to store less data potentially as well to, to, to represent all the keys in your, in your, in your data structure. Um, but you may have to still go out and look at the original tuple or the original record to see what was the original key that you're doing a, uh, doing a lookup on because it may not all be contained in the tree. Uh, whereas in the, the whole key, you know, if key ABC exists in the tuple, key ABC will exist in, in the, the data structure, okay? So again, this will make more sense as we go along. I think I, contrasting it with, with, with Wednesday's lecture. Um, but for our purposes today, we just assume that we're dealing with B plus trees. So today I'm gonna to spend most of the time talking about the BW tree because that was the assigned reading and that's the current data structure we use in our, in our database system today. Um, and part of the reason I wanna I have you guys read this is because it is exposure to how you would actually want to build a latch free data structure, a latch free B plus tree, right? You may, if you read on Hacker News or read on, on, the, on the internet, you may think people are saying like, oh, these latch free data structures or latch free algorithms are superior to one that do use latches and you always want to be using a latch free data structure. Uh, and I certainly thought that that was the case when we first started building our own BW tree, um, but the paper you guys read basically shows that you don't. So. Before we get there though, I want to provide some historical background of what kind of data structures people built originally for in-memory uh, in databases, in particular the T-tree. And then we'll also then finish up how to actually then 
take a regular P plus tree as we described in the introduction class and maybe do something a bit uh, smarter in how we do latching. Right? And that's how, when you read that paper, when you see the B plus tree beat the BW tree, they're going to be using this last, last technique here. Okay? All right, so back in the day, in the 1970s, before we were all born, uh, they invented the B plus tree. Um, and at the time, since they were dealing with disk oriented databases and disk was super slow, uh, the B plus tree turned out to be a, a well designed data structure to allow you to do efficient access for uh, long strides of sequential, sequential data. So I, I traverse the tree I, in log n time. Now I land on my leaf node and I scan along the leaf nodes until I find the key that I'm looking for. Right? So that's fantastic, right? Again, if, if this is slow, sequential reads are faster than uh, random reads, this, this, this approach was, was perfect for it. So then in the 1980s, uh, there was some early work done on you know, designing the first MMRE databases. And in that world, you don't have a slow disk, you have fast random I.O. Uh, in memory. So the idea what they were looking into was, can we build a, it, it, you know, is there an alternative data structure we want to use instead of a B plus tree? that would be preferable and more efficient for a in-memory databases. And so the, the most famous one that came out of this work uh, was called the T-tree. So T-tree is going to look like an AVL tree. Basically, it just means that instead of having a, like in a B-plus tree where the, the keys always exist on the leaf nodes and then the inner nodes are just guideposted to tell, me, tell you whether to go left or right, in the, in, in the T-tree, the keys are going to be scattered all throughout the different nodes, with the leaf nodes and the inner nodes. But the big way, the big difference between the B plus tree and the T tree is that instead of storing the keys in all the nodes, like copies of the keys in all the nodes, they're instead just going to store pointers to the original records, the tuples themselves. And the idea here was back in the 1980s when memory was quite limited, instead of storing redundant copies of the keys, like in a whole key B plus tree, if we just store the pointers, then that's way more efficient in terms of memory. So yes, we paid that penalty of doing that lookup to say, you know, for this pointer, what's the actual key that corresponds to that tuple? But then that reduces this, the amount of total size of, of the index. So the T tree was originally posed in 1986 uh, at the University of Wisconsin. Um, it was Mike Carey and his group were doing a lot of early work in, in memory databases in the 1980s. Um, and in the 1990s, when people started building the first in-memory databases, like commercial ones, like uh, Smallbase out of HP, which became Times 10 that Oracle bought uh, and is still around today, uh, you know, these first early in-memory databases actually used the T-tree design. So one key aspect of why T-trees actually worked back then was that the difference in speed between CPU caches and, and, and DRAM was not as significant as it is now. Right, so back then, if I, if I had a cache miss and I had to go read something in memory, that, you know, in the T tree world in the 1980s, that wasn't that big of a deal. So it was okay to follow that pointer, right? Because you, you know, it wasn't a big performance penalty, and you saved a lot of space in the, uh, in the, um, uh, in the data structure itself, right? So I've been teaching T trees because I think they're fascinating, and there's not a lot of there, there is a Wikipedia article about them. And as I said, times 10 still uses them today. By default, though, like you get, if you create a table or index in, in times 10, you get a B plus tree. You can pass a flag to force to get a T tree. But there's very few databases that still use T trees today. So they're mostly for like embedded devices running like extreme low memory uh, environments. Um, so there really isn't that much information about them. So I always like to talk about them because I think, I think they're kind of fascinating. Uh, and it turns out the guy that actually invented it sent me an email last month and just say, hey, look, I see you're talking about T trees. Um, and the mistake I always made was I said, oh, it's called a T because the, the node looks like a T, but he tells me I'm wrong. And the, so the guy's name is Toby Lehman. He got his PhD at the University of Wisconsin. All right, he named it after himself. So the T <laughs> in T tree is Toby, which I think is awesome. So now, the, for a B plus tree, right, we always say, oh, the B means balance. He says that it actually just means it's named after himself, the Rudy Bayer, the guy that sort of did the original work. He just called it B for himself. I don't know whether that's true, but T, T and T tree means Toby, which is awesome. And he points out some other optimizations that, that I'll talk about in a second. So again, this is why I love the internet, because I've never met this guy. I obviously know who he is. He just found the YouTube video, and he sent me an email, hey, that you're wrong about some things, which is fantastic. Again, so here's, here's what the, the data structure looks like. Again, I always thought, because it was the, the, the nodes looked like, looked like T's, 
And that's why they call them a tea tree, but that's not the case. So what does a node actually look like? So the node is going to be a combination of pointers and then just two keys. So the first thing we're going to have here, these are the data pointers. And these are going to point out now out to the actual table and they correspond to the, to the tuples that they represent. Right? So this is our data table. These are the keys. So these are just pointers to, to the different keys right? or to the original tuples. So these pointers will be sorted in the order of the keys that are stored in the data table. Right? So now, I can, again, I can do that binary search that I would normally do in a B plus tree to jump around to find the, the entry that I'm looking for. But any single time I need to do a comparison, like is my key equal to this key or less than or greater than, I got to follow the pointer to get to the original tuple to figure out what the original key was. All right? So again, in a modern system, I, our pointers are 64 bits. In actuality, they're 48 bits, but like, you have to allocate a 64-bit 64 64-bit 64 uh, pointer space. Back then, you know, these things were, I think, probably 16 bits, and the values maybe were 16 bits. So by not having to store the key plus the, the pointer back to the key, right, I can reduce the size of, of, you know, of, of the amount of space I have to store in each node by half. Right? Right. The other thing we're going to have now is also these data pointers. So unlike in a B plus tree where you normally only have the pointer to either your child or any sibling if you're a leaf node, uh, in a T tree you have to have pointer back to your parent because the leaf nodes aren't going to be the final location of keys. We may have to tra traverse back up, so we need to have a pointer to go back there. And then we, we have pointers to the right and left child. Then we have our node boundary keys, and this will just be the min and max value of the key that's represented by this node. And so anything that is less than this key will be found on this side of the tree. Anything that's greater than that key will be found on the other side. Right? So this is not like, how do I say this? It's not like in a, in a, in a, in a B plus tree where the root node would have, you know, the right and left boundary would be sort of encompass most of the, the space below you in the key space. Right? This is just a slice of the key space. All right, so then now, uh, let's look at an example what we actually want to do a lookup. So we have a three node T tree, and we're trying to find key K2. So again, I start at the root, right? These are just pointers to the original keys. So my key space here for this node here encompasses from, from key four to key six inclusive. So here now I have pointers that are, that are sorted in the key order uh, over to what's being stored in, in the data table. So now then I have my, uh, my pointers down here. And that allows me to do my traversal. So at the very beginning, I start in the root. I'm looking for key, uh, key two. So I only need to potentially do one comparison uh, per key to figure out, per node to figure out where I need to go. So again, I have a copy of this key here because this way I can do this efficiently without having to go out to the uh, original table. But I just do a quick comparison. Is K2 less than K4? And if yes, then I know I want to follow that pointer down here. Right? So even though I said it's kind of inefficient to have to do these pointer lookups, most of the time you don't have to do that. It's only when you land on a node to find what you're looking for that you think the key should be in this that you have to follow this. All right, so then we, we land down here, and then now we check to see whether K2 is greater than K1. It is. We also want to check whether K2 is less than K3. It is. So we know that our key will exist because we know, or it should, could potentially exist because it's, it's within our boundaries here. Right? So now we just do now, again, for this, keep it simple because we, we only have uh, three keys per node, but we can just do a linear scan and look at every single record, or, uh, follow the pointer, and then do our comparison with the key over there. Yes? When would you go back up to the parent? This question is, when would you go back up? Uh, I don't have a slide for this, but when you do a range scan, like find all keys uh, greater than K2, I would come to come down here, scan along, find everything, and then jump back up and keep going. So basically, in the initial search, you're trying to find the, from your side, the leftmost starting point, and then you scan along. And when you realize there's nothing below me, and I think there's something up above, I, I follow back up. There are no sibling pointers. That's why we need to go up. His question is, are there no sibling pointers, and that's how to, why we have to go up? Correct. Yes. Because that's, that, that's how AVL trees work. Yes? So why three keys? Why three in this example? Yeah. Because it fit in the slide. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, sorry, I meant like per node. Oh, so again, like there's there's nothing in the original specification of the key, of the uh, the T tree that says you have to have three. Again, to make it fit, I put three. You could have five, you could have twenty, whatever, it doesn't matter. Yes. What differentiates the key record pointers in a parent versus in a child? Like, what would you think that there versus? 
So her question is, what, what differentiates the, this range and the, and the root between, or the parent between the children? Yeah, like the three in the middle, why would you store something in those three versus putting it in the child? So again, so in a B plus tree, all the keys are at the bottom. Yeah. All right? And in a AVL tree, you can have, or reg actually a regular B tree, you can have keys any, anywhere throughout, or key and value pointers to the actual tuples anywhere in, in, the, in the data structure, in the tree, right? So in a B plus tree, if I only have keys in the leaf nodes, okay, or keys and then the values to the pointers of the leaf nodes, then I have up above, I'm wasting space because now I'm storing just guidepost keys. So they're trying to use, get the maximum usage of, of every single node, and so they store the key value pointers anywhere, including the root node here, the parent node here. No, well, the, the, these are guideposts, but again, if I'm looking for, for key, key five, for example, and I'm here, then I would say key, four, key five is greater than key four, and key five is less than key six, so I know the thing I'm looking for is in here. So I don't need to look at leaf nodes, okay. right? Again, in a B plus tree, they pushed everything to the bottom, because now if I want to do that scan, I don't backtrack, I just scan along the leaf nodes sequentially, and I find what I want. Yeah, yes? I guess I'm kind of curious how this changes things versus like living in like a disoriented setting. Because now, I guess like what's the advantage of having all of the uh, like the uh, keys on the bottom? How does that cater to disk versus this catering to memory? This question is why does having a B plus two design of, of pushing all the the actual the keys and the values to the to the, to the leaf nodes? How is that better for disoriented versus this being scattered anywhere for a for in memory system? So again, if I'm trying to find a find a range of values, right? It's an order preserving tree. So if this is a B plus tree, all the leaf nodes are, 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 are stored in, in that order. I just try to find the leftmost node to start and then I sequentially scan, which is faster on a disk oriented system, at least in the spinning disk. Even, actually, even today on the SSDs, it's still faster. But like, I can just now do a sequential scan along the bottom and find what I want. I never have to go back up. We're trying to avoid random IO. In this world, random IO is not a big deal because it's in memory, so who cares? So I can jump around and traverse back up, and I don't pay a big penalty for that. All right, and by st again, to her, back to her point, by storing the, 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 by using all the upper nodes or the inner nodes of the, of the data structure to actually store keys and values that I care about, I, I, I waste less space, right? Because in a B plus tree, I could, I could delete a key, right, in the leaf node, and, I, and it still could exist in the, in the inner node, because that's my guidepost. Okay. We got here. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. So I, I think I've said a lot of this already. Again, like part of the reason why I, t I teach T trees is because it's just again it's a, it's a different way of thinking about how to do it in, in memory database and memory indexes. Um, and you may come across some, or you may come across somebody who says, "Oh, well, why why are we using a B plus tree for in memory database? Shouldn't we, shouldn't we be using uh, you know in, a more optimized in memory data structure like a T tree?" And the answer is no, because well, I'll, I'll get to the disadvantages in the next slide, but. Just, I, it, this is mostly just for your background information. So again, we already said this. We, store, we use less memory for index because we don't have to store the copy of keys in every single node, and then every single key is also always being used for storing key value pairs and not just guideposts. The other interesting thing that the, the inventor of the T-tree pointed out, which I think is kind of something I didn't think about, is that in a T-tree, because now when you do the evaluation of saying, is, does my key equal this key, or does my search key equal the, the tuples key? I'm following the pointer, I'm looking at the whole record. So once you do that, you're already sort of paid the penalty of following the pointer and now looking at the record. Instead of just comparing to see whether the, the search key matches the, the, the index keys for that tuple, you might as well evaluate all the other predicates that you have in, in your where clause. Right? If I have a where clause where A equals 1 and B equals 2, and my index is only on A, in a B plus tree, I would just do traversal and only look at A because that's the only thing I can see inside my index. Then I have to go do the lookup on the index or the, the tuple, then evaluate B. But in a T tree, you could just do that all at once, right? While I'm looking at the tuple for A, might as well look at B. So you could potentially end up throwing away or throwing out tuples that uh, more quickly than you would otherwise. Yes? But then the key table and the data table would have to be at the same place, right? Your statement is then the key table. And the data table. Like, what do you mean by the key table? Like you had a table, right? This? this? Table. Okay, this is the whole table. This is the whole, yeah. So, okay. yeah. 
this column data, this is like a bunch of other attributes. This is, this is the attribute I'm, key, I'm, I'm index on. There is no separate key table. There's no separate key table. That would be a waste of space. Why? Because yeah. I mean, the index itself is a, is a key table to think about. OK. So for this one here, uh, there are techniques in modern systems to sort of get this benefit as well. So you can do like partial indexes where you, you define a where clause for what keys could be in the index, right? Build an index that only have uh, students that are in, enrolled in 15721, right? And so all the other students that aren't in the class aren't inside the index. And so that way, that's sort of like pre-filtering the where clause ahead of time uh, without having to store some extra information. Or in other systems, you can have include columns. So you can say, I want to be indexed on A, but also, by the way, store B in the, in the leaf nodes so that I don't have to go do look up the index or look up the tuple to figure out how to evaluate a predicate on B. Right? Postgres can do this, SQL Server can do this. This is actually a bit more common now today. Um, and it's not as bad as actually having to store B everywhere throughout the, the, the index. You're only storing it in, in just the, the leaf nodes. So the benefit you would get from this, I think, is not as significant as maybe it was back in the day when they evaluated this. All right, so why don't anybody use them? Well, I didn't talk about how to actually how to maintain this thing and keep it balanced. If yellow trees are kind of tricky because you don't really do splits and merges, you have to do rotations. All right, so now I have to take more heavyweight latches on my data structure in order to make uh, significant changes. And that's sort of related to this as well. Like it's hard to make sure that I guarantee that uh, all my operations in it are thread safe. And then as I said, once the CPU caches got much faster, uh, the cost of going chasing those pointers and looking at the tuple actually became quite significant. So it's better off actually just, yes, you're making a redundant copy of keys in, in, in your data structure, but that avoids this, this penalty here. So you're paying a little extra storage overhead to get a quite a significant uh, performance efficiency gain. So there's a paper done in like 1999 by uh, Ken Ross in, in Columbia that basically said that T trees are a bad idea for in-memory indexes. And actually a, a B plus tree or a variant that looks like a B plus tree is a better way to go. And so that's why I say nobody, nobody today uh, actually, actually, actually uses this other than like, um, you know, embedded devices. Like there's a database called Extreme DB that's supposed to run on like, you know, little IoT devices. And in that world, sure, right? That, I think that makes sense, but for, you know, a large, you know, Xeon server, T2s are, are, are probably not the right choice. Yes? Uh, how can it binary search inside a node since we have to go to the pointer, it follows the pointer, and then we don't know if they are in order? His question is, how can a binary search actually work here? Uh -huh. Well, again, so this is linear search. So say I did binary search and I landed here. So what am I going to go do? I'm going to go look up the key in the data table. I get the, the key now, and then I compare it with the key I'm looking for. If my key is greater than that key, then I know I want to go this way. If it's less than that, I go the other way. Oh, so they're, they're sorted. These are sorted on the key, on the key, the values of the keys. The data table can be sorted any way it wants, right? It's, it's, it's a relational database, bag algebra, these are unsorted. So all this, again, the point I was trying to make is all the standard tricks we would do in a B plus tree of doing like linear search or binary search or interpolation search, we can still do all those things, it's just we have to pay extra a penalty to actually jump, jump over there and see what the actual real key is. One thing actually would be interesting to do, though, um, now that I think about it, um, uh, it's too late to do this for Project 2, but uh, so as I said before, like, when you get a pointer in, in, on x86, like, you have to allocate 64 bits, right? But in the, in the hardware, they actually only store 48 bits. So you kind of have 16 bits there. You can actually store whatever you want. And when you, do a, when you dereference that pointer, that dereference that memory address, the, the, the hardware just ignores the 16 bits. So you could do something where, like, this is 64 bits. I still have the 48-bit pointer to take me back wherever I need to go into the data table. But I could store part of the key in here. So some of the times I have to go look up, sometimes I don't. So yeah, that would potentially work. But the problem with this is, one, Intel could take that away at any time and start using the full 64 bits. I, 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 was, at a, uh, I was at a sort of technical seminar but with this Intel guy a few years ago. They said like, they had an in-memory database that was maxing out 2 to the 48 you know, minus 1 uh, addresses, and that eventually Intel would be going 2 to the 64. So don't store anything in those extra 16 bits. But that was like three years ago, and it hasn't happened yet. Uh, so I, I, I don't know what, what 
I don't know whether I don't think it's a good idea, at least a future proof of the system. We will see this technique used though for hash hash joins from Hyper. They use chain hash table because they store that some crap in that they store a bloom filter in that 16 bits, uh, which is kind of cool. Okay, I don't dwell on T trees too much. Like this is like again, the, the BW, VW tree and the B plus tree are or 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 more modern. We should focus on that. So any questions for T trees before we switch over? Okay. So Part of the reason why it's difficult to make uh, the T-tree uh, perform efficiently or make it, even make it latch-free is that we have pointers all over the place. We have, you know, every, every parent pointer has a pointer to the child, and that child has a pointer to the parent. So now if I need to move one of them, uh, and I change one memory address, I've got to change a bunch of memory addresses to all the children that are pointing to that parent. And I can't do that with atomic parent swap instructions because you can't update mem multiple memory addresses. It's like one 64-bit or one 128-bit location. I can't say atomically update these two things. So related to this, we, this is also a reason why we can't build a latch tree B plus tree, you know, for the same reason. We're going to have pointers to things in multiple locations and update them atomically. It's just not possible. So to sort of motivate the design of how we may potentially want to build a, a latch tree B plus tree, the way to sort of solve this multiple address problem is that if we had an indirection layer or some centralized data structure where we could record uh, our, these addresses and then multiple, uh, multiple elements or nodes in our data structure could know how to do lookups in that indirection layer, that, that mapping table. And then now I just need to do a compare and swap in that mapping table, change one address, and that automatically propagates the change through throughout the entire data structure, and then I can make it latch free. So that's essentially what the BW tree is. Well, the BW tree is a latch free B plus tree uh, that came out of the Hecaton project. As I said, I think two classes ago, uh, the, the awesome people at Microsoft, they, they, when they first started building Hecaton, they were originally building it with skipless, because skipless are latch free. Then they realized skipless are a bad idea. The, the grass we will show, show that, it, that it's, it performs poorly. And then what they came up with was, was the BW tree. I should also comment too that the BW tree, although it's sort of described in our paper and there's most of the papers that, that talk about, or at least the original BW tree paper that talks about from Microsoft, talks about it in the context as an in-memory system. Uh, and Hackathon's an in-memory system. There's another project they built called Deuteronomy out of Microsoft that actually stored things on Flash. And so the Delta record approach in, in the BW tree of just, you know, appending changes to nodes, those actually work really well for Flash environments because you're just appending to a log. But for an in-memory database, uh, the BWG is going to be a bad idea. So I'm jumping ahead, but before we get into the details, who here read the paper and felt like they understand the BW tree? All right, I ask this every year. Very few people raise their hand. Like, it's a hard data structure, right? It's hard to wrap your head around, uh, and there's a lot going on. And this is not so much a commentary about uh, the complexity of the BW tree, it's just the complexity of any lat tree data structure, any lat tree algorithm, is actually pretty gnarly, right? And so, a lot of times, even though you're, you're using latches could potentially be slower, the engineering complexity of, of the data structure, or, or what you're trying to do, is will be significantly less, and therefore you're, you're less likely to make mistakes, and you, it's easier for other people to work on it. So right now, for our BW tree in our system, I think it's like, I don't know, 5,000, 8,000 lines of code, uh, very few people in, in our team can actually touch it. The one guy that wrote it is like, he's not like crazy, but like he's kind of eccentric, right? So he wrote the BW tree. The rumor is he wrote the BW tree for our, on our team. For, it took him like a year and a half. Uh, he wrote it, a lot of it in Notepad um, on a Windows laptop. It was Windows 10, but he modifies Windows 10 to make it look like Windows 95. And then he sets the default font to Comic Sans. And he wrote, again, one of the hardest data structures he wrote in that environment. So like, there's a lot going on. Um, all right, so let, let, so let me go through the actual key ideas, the main ideas, and then we'll sort of increase the complexity of what else this, you know, we, we need to do our data structure to actually support real things. Yes? Small question, but why is it called the BW tree? Question is, why is it called the BW tree? And I'm gonna take a guess. It was in the title of the paper. Buzzwords. So it was, uh, it, like it was all take all the buzzwords at the time when the paper was originally written, like lat tree, in memory, uh, LSM, long structure merge trees. Uh, to take all those buzzwords and they throw it into a single index, and it's called the BW tree. 
your face is really disappointed. Um, it's, it was really bizarre. Yeah. All right. Okay, so two key ideas, the deltas and the mapping table. So they're going to argue that uh, you want to avoid cache invalidation, right? Again, think of like a multi-socket system where you have a bunch of uh, NUMA nodes and the CPUs are trying to update the same data structure to reduce uh, invalidation of having to make in-place changes to the nodes, they're going to do d delta records. So you pen delta records to the node as you modify them, and then at some later point, you'll consolidate them. Now, this is not entirely true because it won't work the way we actually implement it because we're actually storing the delta records in the nodes themselves, so you still have cache invalidation. Um, but this is what they claim, and we didn't see it this. See, see it, see, we didn't see this, this, uh, this benefit. The other thing was the mapping table, and again, this was a central location that you're going to store all the, the addresses of physical nodes, and then now if I need to change the address of a logical node, I need to change the physical address of a logical node, I just go to my mapping table and, and update it. Okay? So let's look at a really simple example. So we have a three node uh, BW tree. So the first thing to point out here is that, again, we have our mapping table, and every node is going to be assigned uh, a page ID or a node ID. Right? So page 101, 102, 104. And then now in our mapping table, we'll have physical pointers that tell us the address, the starting address for each of these nodes. So I'll denote this in, in, the, in, in all these uh, diagrams. The, the, the solid black line will, will represent the physical address, and the dotted red lines will represent the logical addresses. So in, in this case here, we have uh, the root node, and it has two pointers to its children. So the only thing we need to store now in that node is just the page ID of the children, 102 and 104. So now if any time I need to go say, all right, I, I'm traversing my tree, I'm at page 101, and now I need to get to page 102, I, this is not a pointer I can actually follow. I have to do a lookup in my mapping table and say, oh, I want page 102, tell me the physical address of it. And then now I can land into this. Right? Again, it had this indirection layer that allows me to take any logical uh, page ID and map it to a physical address. All right, so let's see now if, uh, yeah, when we do an update. So let's say I have a single page here, right, page 102. Um, and now every single time I'm going to do an update to a page, like insert a key, delete a key. Uh, we're not worried about updating keys because that's, that's, that's just a delete followed by an insert. All right, so it's a delete or insert. So again, instead of making the change directly on the page itself, right, so this is just another, this is just a, a node like in a B plus tree. I have a, 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 an array of keys and array of values. Right, it's the same, same, same physical layout. But now instead of making an update to those arrays, I'm going to create a delta record that says what the change I want to make into uh, the key in, that's represented in 102. So let's say now I want to insert key, key 0. So this record will have a physical pointer to the base page. So how do I get that? Well, I, I would do my lookup in my mapping table, uh, and I would say I know what this physical address is going to be, 102. So then now, at this point, nobody can see my change because if anybody's looking for page 102, they would look in the mapping table and see this pointer and bypass my, my delta record entirely. So what, what I need to do now is do, to do install it, I'm going to do a compare and swap in the mapping table to replace the, the physical address that it used to point to to now my physical address. And now that anybody goes looks at 102, they're not going to land here, they're going to land here recognize that I'm looking at a delta record and evaluate it accordingly. So if I'm looking for key zero, I land this delta record here. I say, oh, insert key zero. Voila, I'm done. I found exactly what I was looking for. If I'm not looking for key zero, then I just follow along now down here, and then now I, I, I can look in, the, in, the, uh, in the, the base page, the base node. So is this clear? This is like the, sort of the, the, the core idea of what they're doing. Yes? Thanks for, like, Your question is, uh, your question was like, if I'm storing this with this, no, like, if because I'm not storing with this. Uh, what I'm saying is, if like, you store like the newest record in page one hundred two, and you store the reverse delta, and then you point back to the reverse delta. Oh, so it's like this is always the latest version, right, right. and then uh, 
if, if I want to say what was the version before this, then I have to somehow, and then this would be like, what would be the verse at insert k0? What, like you said, this is like the reverse of the change you made here. Right. So what's the reverse of, of insert k0? It's not really delete k0 because it didn't exist before. Right. And then what would happen now, at least in that case, and for your example, I'd modify this page to be in cache invalidation to the other, other CPU sockets. But then also it's another cache invalidation because I updated another region of memory. At least in this case, I, just, and I create this delta record. This stays unmodified. So the only sort of cache reference I need to update would be this thing here. Well, but, but in your, I think in the paper's implementation, like the other reference is like just next to you. Yeah, they're packed in together. Yeah. Yes. We do that for, for efficiency reasons. Uh -huh. But that's going to be the same invalidation. Uh, so your cache line, though, is what? 64. Your cache line is 64 bytes, so as long as you update something less than, something more than 64 bytes, it'd be okay. Um, I'd have to think about that. But I think it's, it's sort of weird. Because, like, again, you're, you're creating a reversal of something that doesn't exist, and you would need to know, like, you would need, in your example, you would need to know, I'm looking for K0, I don't, I see it here, I'm done. But yeah, what, there's no reversal for that. Delete, maybe. You could say, all right, I see something here. I, I don't see something, but did it used to exist? Yeah, I have to think about it. What, you, just, what you're saying is weird. Sorry, yeah, so. Sorry, could you repeat again? In what scenario would you follow the pointer to the base? The question is, like, when would I actually follow this pointer, right? So at this point here, I've, been created, the, I've created this delta record. It has a physical pointer to the page. Nobody else can see it, though, because everyone else is following the mapping table that takes you to the base page. I do the compare and swap on this, and now anybody that's looking for page 102 lands here. doesn't matter whether you're looking for K0 or not. If you're looking for page 102, you land here. And then you, you, then you have to evaluate. You're essentially replaying like a log in memory to, to say, well, what's actually being stored in 102? The question is, the more, the more data records you have, the longer it takes to actually find the, the key, if you had to look at the base page, yes. We'll fix that in a second. Yes? What if there's like another concurrent delta update? Would there be like an L4 for the So his question is, what if there's a concurrent delta rec uh, update? Next slide, we'll handle that. So again, now if I do, just, just do another one. If I do a delete eight, same thing. Compare and swap on this, right? And now the points of this. So now anybody coming along for one or two, right? They would have to evaluate delete K0, K8, that's not what I want. Delete key zero, that's not what I want, and then do the, the search down here in the, the base node. Okay? Uh, so we've already covered this. Like, this is just doing search, like a regular B plus tree, right? Um, if the thing you're looking for is found in the a delta chain, you're done. Otherwise, again, you just do a search at the bottom. All right? All right, so let's handle uh, his, his problem. So now we're back here. We've installed uh, a delta record for inserting key, uh, key zero. And then now I have two threads that are going to try to install two delta records at the exact same time. So two threads are inside, inside the index. And they say, oh, I need to perform an operation. And this is the node I want to perform. This is the base page I want to perform my operation on. So the first guy wants to delete key, key, key eight. The second guy wants to delete uh, key six. So what's going to happen here? How do we install the, these updates? Like the updates actually only apply whenever you update the address pointer? Correct. So his, his statement is the updates are only applied and only visible to everyone else if, you know, when you update this thing. So these guys now are going to do compare and swap at the same time on this memory location in the mapping table. But only one can succeed. So you know, essentially what you're doing is when you're back here, you know what the, you know what the, the physical address is to the head of, of Delta record, the Delta chain for this node. Right? That's what these guys, that's how these guys got, got these, these, these physical addresses. So now when I do a compare and swap, you say, if the current value of this address here is what I think it should be, then go ahead and, and swap it and install my new update. Right? So let's say the first guy is able to do this. Right? So that's fine. So now he is at the head of the, of the Delta, record, or Delta chain, um, and his, his update got installed. The second guy, would, that compare and swap operation would fail because it would do the, the evaluation of the mapping table 
see that the address is not what it thought it was going to be, pointing to this dust record here, it's now pointing to this one. So it knows that somebody else got in before he did and updated this. So my update would now fail. And then depending on the implementation, I could either try to do another compare and swap and try to update this, or I could just repeat and do re the whole operation, traverse down, and, and try again. If you try again at the right moment, like the paper says that you have to traverse again. Yes. If you try again right now, then say what will happen is that you manage to do compare and swap, then that guy's thing will get removed. Because you will only add your current chain. You, so you're saying that if I try to do compare and swap now. That like, say insert k6 failed, right? Yes. And now you try again. Yes. So you'll only insert after k0. Yes. But somebody, so that delete k8 will get uh, disappeared. No, no. So I, what I could do is I update this, this physical address here down point to this. You're saying you'll read the whole chain again and then read back. Well, no. So, like, you, you, so if you're here, the compare and swap succeeds. This is fine. But His compare and swap fails. Okay. So now I could go back and say, well, it just failed. What's in there now? Yeah, then you have to copy the whole chain again, right? No, you don't because, have to copy. Because there may be two, three things that somebody else has inserted and you have to insert on top of that. But again, like this thing is always going to point to whatever the head of the version chain, the Delta record chain is. You have is. to get that top thing and point towards your insert cases. Correct. So you have to like, okay, then top and you have to change that to that. Oh, I, I just go look and see this again. You could do it that way. I don't think we implemented it that way because for like safety reasons, because like you don't know now that this thing might do a split and the thing you're looking for may no longer be encapsulated in this index or th this node here. Like this might have done a split and now where K6 should be should not be page 102. Yeah. It should now be in another page. So paper says that you copy the whole version chain every time uh, in your private space. Okay. When, you, when you do the evaluation, yes. Yes. But don't you have to necessarily abort because could you run into like an ABA issue where like you have like when you try to like let's say you try to like uh, update it doesn't give an update right and in between you try to compare and swap you fail and in between that your record is deleted and so then you're updating a deleted record in your version chain or something like that so don't you always have to report so so again we're only going to do deletes and inserts right so there's no we don't have to worry about updates okay. right the other thing too is like this is a, inside the data structure we don't have to worry about higher level consistency issues of the transactions. Like, I think maybe what you're possibly saying is like, well, what if one transaction deletes K8 and I try to insert it or I, I'm trying to read it and it's been deleted. All that's handled up above in the, in like either doing this, the, rerunning the scans or doing the validation stuff, all that's handled above us. We just care about the, the low level linearizability of correctness of the data structure. And this thing will handle that for us. Yes? Like why? Like why, when doing a traversal on the route to like whatever node you're currently accessing, that case would be different from um, you know restarting again. I mean, my, like I don't really see the point of why you worry about splitting on a page one or two. Um, like you have to restart from the beginning. Like how does that restarting from the beginning of the route actually ensure that this will not happen in terms of inconsistency? Um, when I say in, in, so inconsistency, it has to do with like. It, it has to do with like, uh, I'm trying to insert something in a, in a, I'm trying to insert a logical key that is not, re that is not represented or should not be stored at this, this, this location here. So if now key six should not be in page 102, it should be page 103. If I try to immediately come back and do a compare and swap here, now I'm inserting key six into this page, but anybody else that looks for key six is not gonna land here. They're gonna follow the, the guidepost and land a some other node and they'll have a false, false negative. So if, when I'm doing the traversal from the beginning of the route, if the, the problem's all solved. The traversal, um, how, how do I make sure that I'm going to the one that I, no one is else, like, how, I'm, how do I make sure I'm landing yeah, on the page where I should be? Right, yeah. Because that's just the way, I mean, the, because we're enforcing the, 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 the ordering of the directions of where you go from left to right, from one node to the next, right, with, with the keys. And so we're, we're guaranteeing that we're propagating the changes from the, the bottom to the top, so you're not in this weird state where like something's pointing to something that it shouldn't be, or something's being stored in the place that it shouldn't be. By always restarting at the top, it's inefficient, and that's sort of the, the, the downside of a, of a latch tree data structure, but we guarantee the correctness, the consistency of the data structure at a, at a, at a physical level. Okay, so now to his earlier question of like, well, can't this delta chain uh, get kind of long? Yes, it, it will, and so we want to do consolidation. 
So basically what's going to happen is uh, one thread will recognize as it's going along this delta chain has gotten too long. All right, this could be like a threshold. You say if the delta chain is, is, has, more, is, has more than these, this number of records, then I want to do a consolidation. So what you're going to do is you're going to make it first a copy of, of the base page, and then now you're going to apply the, the, the changes in reverse order of, of the delta chain. Let me take a guess. Why were you doing rever reverse order? That is the order. That is the order, right? Like, this is, like, in physical time, the change to be made is, like, this is the oldest change, and this is going to the newest change, right? So if I say, if, I, if I'm deleting K8 here, uh, and I insert K8 here, then it doesn't make sense to try to delete something if I'm going in this direction. So we always go in reverse order. So basically, it's going to be, as I scan through, and I recognize this delta change has gotten too long, I have a copy of all of these things, and now I can replay them in reverse order, one by one, right? So now, after I replay all my changes, now this new copy of the node represents all the same things that are represented by this base page and its, and its delta records. So how do I install it now? Compare and swap, easy, right? All I needed to go back now is compare and swap to this, this uh, for the record here, uh, the entry here for 102, and now anybody else that comes along can, can see me. If I fail, then I've wasted work. I've done my consolidation and somebody else changed something. Like if someone else appends a new delta record before I, get my, uh, before I do my compare and swap, well then that solves the problem of not seeing the, you know, potentially missing a, a delta record update. Because now this thing would have pointed to a new delta record that I didn't see, and therefore I throw away my work and start over. Yes? It calls this a virtual node? Yeah. yeah it, it's just in the heap. Okay. It's just like a node that nobody else can see yet. It's in, it's in the, like, only my thread that's doing the consolidation can, can, can see it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I was wondering, why don't we just install all the changes directly in the pages and, like, not have the delta records? This question is, why don't I just, instead of doing this and comparing and swapping this, why don't I just take all these things and, and apply it to this? Yeah, not have the chain, chain uh, of delta records. Like, what, what benefit does it give, give us? Chain? I think your question is, why even have these delta records? Why not apply this change here? Um, again, they're, they're arguing that uh, in order to make it latch free, if, I, if, I, if I'm allowing anybody to make any change down here, uh, you still need latches. Right, because these things have to, be, have to be sorted, and you have to apply latches to try to like you know enforce the ordering of them. So they're trying to be entirely latch free. Yes. Is the compare and swap like technically a latch? It's like this question is: Is a compare and swap technically a latch? We will cover this next class. Could you implement latches with compare and swap? No. Okay. Right. So latch would be like I hold, I'm, I'm holding a latch on some critical section, and I do a bunch of stuff. So this is like, I, here's a single update, I apply. Now you're right, well, if it's a spin latch, what do you do? You spin until you get the latch. So I could keep spinning until I get the thing I want. But we don't. Because we don't, because like we, yeah, we, we always want to restart. Yes? What he was saying, like, the problem with that is if we apply the changes on the page, right, and we compare and swap the whole thing, then we have to copy the entire page, make one change, and then compare and swap the entire thing. By doing this delta thing, we are only changing, like, very, like, we are adding only one thing. Otherwise, we have to copy the whole page. No, you see, if, to make it latch free, yes. yes. If, if you don't want to make it latch free, then, like, so, like you take a latch, do the update, yes. Then you have a B plus tree. Yeah. Yes. So, like, um, if you, whenever you try to recompute this, like, consolidated node, yes. right, and, like, let's say you go back to compare and swap and you fail, right? I don't necessarily think you actually have to throw out all that work because you could essentially refollow this new chain and then see where like your change to this last were and then update and compare and swap that one pointer and swap yourself in. Like if you're right, if this is just an insert, you could say, all right, I missed it, put, just put it in and then try it again. Yeah. I don't think we do that. I think we play it safe. Because again, if you have a split or merge, that's when that's when that's when things get bad. Yeah. Alright, so 102 is new 102 is installed. This guy's sitting around, what do we need to do with it? We, want, we obviously want to clean it up at some point, right? So these things can be marked as garbage, and at some point we need to clean them up. 
what does this look like? This is starting to look like MVCC, right? Once we recognize that something's no longer visible to a bunch of threads or transactions in the MVCC world, then we want to go ahead and clean this up and reuse the memory. So this now looks a little bit different though than, uh, slightly different than what we've talked about before, but the high-level idea is going to be the same. Right? So what, for garbage collection for these in-memory data structures, what are we, what's, the, what's the issue? Well, we don't want to throw away something uh, that somebody could be reading or jump into because then they'll have a seg fault because they're reading you know, unallocated memory. So like, say I want to delete K2 here, and it, this is a simple single direction linked list. Right? My thread is here, it's at key, key one, it sees the physical pointer now to the next key, but then the garbage collector comes in, cleans up this thing, but now I follow this pointer to some random invalid, you know, in, er, memory address that doesn't mean anything anymore, and you know, worst case scenario, I seg fault. Actually, worst case scenario, also, like, I could read garbage and think it's something real, right? So we want to avoid this. So the two approaches we'll talk about are reference counting and epoch-based reclamation. But there's a bunch of other techniques to use. Hazard pointers. Uh, uh, what's the other one? I forget, too. I forget what they're called. It doesn't matter. Like, there's other things. These are the two ones that are the, the most prominent and most common in uh, in-memory databases. So. Reference counting is essentially what you get with the shared pointer on the, on the C++ and the standard template library. So all it is now is that inside of every node in a data structure or in a shared pointer inside the pointer, the, the pointer data structure itself, we're just going to maintain a counter that keeps track of the number of threads that could be accessing a, that memory location. Right? So before I go access it, I increment the counter. That's an atomic add. Right? That, that part's efficient. But then when I'm done doing, you know, accessing it, then I decrement that counter to, uh, by one. So the garbage collector would know that it's safe to, to, to deallocate some region of memory when we know that our counter is zero because we know no thread could be looking at it. So as long as everyone updates that counter before they jump to the next location, right, we won't have, the, have an issue. Turns out, though, this is actually really bad for performance because now I'm, every, every single time I, I jump to a new location, I'm incrementing this counter. And that's a global counter that everybody needs to be able to read and write. So if I have a lot of cores, a lot of sockets, that's a cache invalidation message to everyone, just to go read something. Yes? Does that invalidation also apply when you're updating the map in general? Uh, his question is, does, does this invalidation also apply when you're updating the map in general? Uh, yes, but, but, but I can read the mapping table without having to update it. This turns every read into a write. Okay. This is bad. So again, this is what you get in shared pointers, uh, and this, you know, th th this is obviously going to be slow. So one obvious thing to point out, though, is we don't actually care what that counter actually, the value actually is. All we really care is whether it's non-zero, right? So whether it's one, two, four, whatever, who cares? We know somebody's reading it. We can't garbage collect something. It's only when it's zero. Do we, do, we, do, we, do we actually care? So maybe it's now instead of storing this fine-grained counter per, per node in our data structure, we could just try to keep track of a higher-level construct, more coarse-grained counter, and just know that when nothing can be visible to by anybody within some, some time range, just like an MVCC, then it's safe for us to go ahead and remove, remove things. So this is what epoch-based garbage collection uh, is. And we briefly mentioned this uh, last class. And I said I was going to spend more time on it today. But again, the high-level idea of what we did in MVCC for epoch-based garbage collection is the same one here. So there's going to be this global counter that's going to be periodically updated. Right? You can have a thread do this or do it cooperatively, co cooperatively every 10 milliseconds. And the only thing we need to keep, keep track of now in our, in our index is that what threads exist at a given epoch. Right? What, what time did they show up? What epoch did they show up? And then when did they leave? And I don't care what epoch that, that they left in. All I care is that, like, that, that they did leave. So I could show up in epoch 1, then I leave in epoch 2. That's fine, but I've still only considered uh, to be in epoch 1. And then now what will happen is when we do our consolidation, we'll say what's the current epoch of, my, uh, of, of, of this node, or so what's the current epoch of the, of the, of the, of the BW tree. I mark that garbage with that epoch. And then once I know that there's no thread that could be possibly seeing that node, because they're not in my, that epoch anymore, then it's safe for me to go ahead and uh, delete it, remove it. 
So in Linux, this is called RCU, read, copy, update. This is used in uh, various different data structures internally inside of the kernel. Um, if you go read systems papers, they'll refer to this as RCU. In database papers, we refer to this as, as epoch-based garbage collection. Right? So now to do this again, and this is just repeating what I said, but to do this in the BW tree, again, we tag everything we're going to do. Any search, up, insert, or delete is tagged with what my current epoch is. We register with the garbage collector when a thread shows up to say, you know, I'm, I'm showing up, I'm going to do something, I'm in this epoch. And then when you leave, you deregister, and then the garbage collection can say, I know that nobody else is in this epoch, here's a bunch of garbage for that epoch, let me go ahead and remove it. So let's look at this example here. So this is the same one we had before. We did our, we're going to do a consolidation on, uh, on 102. So CPU1, thread1, one is going to do this consolidation. So it, when it showed up, uh, in, in the very beginning, it just registered with this epoch table inside of the garbage collector, all right? And then now there's some other thread, thread two, all right, that's going to be scanning this at the same time. So we register with the epoch table. So now we do now the compare and swap to update 102. And now nobody else that comes in uh, after this point will ever see this original thing. But this thread here is, is still hanging out. We actually don't know where it is. It could be anywhere in, in, in the inside the data structure looking at any node, but it could potentially be in here. So instead of tracking exactly you know, what node am I looking at or what delta red I'm looking at every single time, we just say, hey, there's somebody around that, you know, with, within this time. So now uh, we register this garbage with it, it, within epoch, uh, this first epoch. This guy goes away. Uh, we deregister. This guy scans down. And then he finds whatever he's looking for on page 102. Right? And then when he's done, it's safe for us to go ahead and, and delete this. Right? So instead of actually giving every node a timestamp or every delta record a timestamp like an MVCC, we just have this coarse grain epochs. Yes? Uh, we, we have an epoch table for, uh, for every node? The epoch table is for the entire instance of the, of the data structure. All it is, it's just, it's just a, it's a pointer to the physical address of, of this node here. So it just says like, all right, if I register uh, this garbage here, I'm, a, I'm not actually making a copy of this. I'm just storing the pointer to the head of the, the, the delta record chain. So then I know that anything, any delta record and then the base table, the base page itself can be garbage collected. And again, nobody else can, can, can ever jump to this because we did compare and swap here and we're able to, you know, and now point to the new page. Yes? Your question is, is it, what is the data structure for registering the threads? Yeah, it's just a queue. Uh, an array, like it could be an array pointing to a queue because you could cycle through the epochs. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, it could be a bottleneck, but traversing the index itself is more expensive than that. Yes? So when CPU2 was compacting the new 102, what if another delta record was that one? So, so we're back here? Oh, so when CPU1 was creating we're here. So what if somebody else creates a new delta record here while we're doing compaction? Well, what would happen when I do the compare and swap? I would fail. I would fail because it's now pointing to now some delta record above this that I didn't see. And that's what I was saying to him. Like, you could be smart and say, oh, well, this is just another insert. Let me reapply it uh, and then do the compare and swap. Um, for that one, you basically have to do a diff. You're trying to figure out, well, what did I have and what did I miss? So if it's just one, maybe it's not a big, big of a deal, but if it's a bunch of them, you might just be better off just restarting. But again, the compare and swap, because this, this mapping table guarantees that this thing's always going to be like the, the ground truth of what the, correct, what the correct pointer should be. So if it's not what we think it is, somebody else got it before, before we did. OK. So far, so good, right? Let's make it hard. Let's do, let's do splits and merges, right? So let's, we'll just focus on splits. Uh, merges are essentially the same thing in reverse order. So now we're going to introduce two new uh, delta record types, the split delta record and the separator. So the split is going to be a delta record that says that uh, the node, page, the base page below us in our, in, that, in our delta chain has been split. And here's where to go find uh, the two new boundaries of keys. And so we'll have a physical pointer down to the, the, the next delta record, and then a logical pointer to the page that, that got, we got split off from. And then a separator delta record. It's not required for correctness, but it's just a, it's a, it's a shortcut up above in, in, the, in the higher parts of the tree to say, oh, by the way, below you, there was a split. Here's where to go find the things you're looking for. 
So let's look at an example here. So now we have four pages. Um, and we're going to want to do a, and then the, the keys are sort of organized like this. And we want to do a split on, on 103. So let's say we want to insert, uh, actually, let's, let's just do a split. We don't, we don't have to insert anything. So the first thing I'm going to do is do a split in, you know, from my thread you know, with a virtual node here that nobody could actually see yet. And then he's just now pointing to the next sibling uh, 104. So now I'm going to do a compare and swap here. Nobody else could, could get in there before I did, so that's not a big deal. But I want to update now the, the, the delta record, the delta chain for 103 with this new split record here. Right? And the way, what the split record is going to store is that there's the physical pointer to the base page, and that just says key three to key three, key, keys key three to five are here, and then five to key seven are over here, and this is just a logical pointer. So now I do my compare and swap to now update 103 to be now pointing at my, uh, my new split record. So now, anybody that comes along is looking for key five, for example, will come down, follow this, uh, the version chain here. Actually, these, these all get updated to automatically. Again, because I have the mapping table, all right, these guys have logical pointers. As soon as I update that, everyone automatically now points to the split record. So anybody coming along, either from, from the bot, you know, as a sibling pointer, or from the top, would see the split record and recognize, oh, well, if I'm looking for key five, I want to follow a logical pointer here. Otherwise, follow the physical pointer down here. Now, this point here, we actually have redundant copies of key five and key six, right? They're still stored in, in 103 because we can't do in-place updates. So, you, so when you're now traversing like down here and saying, I'm trying to find keys greater than four, for example, I would have to re remember that I saw a split record up above that said, all right, this node here, if you're looking for anything greater, key five or greater, should not be stored in 103. Even though you may see it in this, one, in this 103, you know you need to go find it down, down here in 105, right? So then now I need to uh, uh, sort of propagate this, this key space up above, or, key, or, or, or split up above. So at this point here, the, the root table has the, still the original uh, splits or demarcations for what's below me. And so if I, from a correctness standpoint, if I follow it in here, and I'm looking for, for example, key five, uh, I would say key, three is, uh, key five is in between k three and k seven, and still follow that logical pointer down to the, the split one, and then I would recognize I really need to go down to this other side, not this other side. But to avoid having to, to, to you know, do that unnecessary lookup, I could insert a separator uh, record that just says, all right, well, key five and k seven are now at this new, uh, there's a logical pointer to this new node here, right? Same thing, compare and swap on this. Now that gets installed. And anybody else that comes along would, would see this. So again, you don't need the separator for correctness. It's, it's just for efficiency reasons. And then when I do consolidation, I'll obviously compact it and update this correctly. Any questions? Um, what are the logical, logical uh, pointer The logical pointer is what? What, what? what is a logical pointer? The, what, what, what are we actually storing? The ID? Yeah, the page ID. So if I'm scanning along, like find all keys greater than, greater than equal to K, K2, I would land here and say, all right, well, I see K2, but I want to keep going because I'm looking for things greater than K2. Oh, well, I need to follow my sibling pointer. My sibling pointer is page 103, right? That's what, you know, that's sort of this thing is, is but I'm just only storing, you know, the ID 103 here. So in order to get to there, I go look at my mapping table, and voila, now my physical address points to here. And then and I can either scan down, find what I need, or split to one side or the other as needed. Yes? So with like your delta chain, um, if you want to do like an update to page 105 or 103, um, would like 103 and 105 share like the same delta chain? Or? No, so, so his question is, when I did the split here, would, would 105 and 103 share the same delta chain? No. Because wouldn't like the split go on like the delta chain? And the the like split is the delta chain of 103, because that's what we're back here. Right? Yeah. So again, I, I just copied out the keys I need for 105. Um, now I have the split record here. And I want to have anybody that goes to 103 should know that I split. Right? So my compare and swap needs to be on this guy's delta chain. This guy has his own delta chain. Okay. And again, if I now start making changes to page 105, well, that is going to have its own delta, delta chain. But the logical pointer to it will still get me to the head of that, that delta chain. 
Okay, so like if anything like goes to like 103, that's supposed to go to 105, um, it just gets appended to like the head of like 105 delta chain. If anything goes to 103, that should be going to 105. Before you have like the separator set up. Now the separator just allows you to avoid having to do like an extra, extra lookups going down. Again, say, so you, your statement is something that should be in 105 can never end up at 103. Yeah. Because, or it can't, because like I have this split record say, well, if I want to insert, say, key 5.5, yeah. that should be in between 5, 5 and 5 and 6. I would get here, 5.5 is greater than or equal to 5, so therefore it has to go here. I, can't, I can never get there. But you wouldn't like immediately traverse down to like 105. Why wouldn't you? If you're here, yes. Or like, like when you're at like the... When you're up here? Yeah. No, again, so like, there's a lot of lines here, so it's, it's confusing, sorry. So the root node still thinks that if I'm looking for key range K3 to K7, I should be looking at lo a logical pointer 103, right? So th this arrow should really be here. But physically, when I do the lookup, I'm going to land at the split. So I'm looking for key 5. I, do my, I think it should be in page 103. I land in a delta record that, that's a split. And I would recognize, oh, it's a split, therefore I need to look at the boundaries in the split, and then that'll take me left or right. Okay, but like, at what point can you like directly go from like the parent to like 105 instead of like passing through the split all the way to like... Here. So this is the, the separator key is basically updating this information. Yeah. Okay. So once this thing's installed, and I'm looking for key 5, I could potentially go now down here. Again, this is like, say I could store four things in this node, and I don't need to split it. Instead of having to do in-place update to add a fourth entry or guidepost in this thing, the, the separator thing does that for me. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yes? So uh, going back to the previous questions, where if you do compare and swap fails, you would essentially see this split node, right? So if you... If, it, if, the compare, if the compare and swap fails where? Uh, whatever, like, when you're trying to update, like, the page one of the screen. So here. Yeah, so um, in the implementation, and you guys say that you have to go start from the root because you might not be going to the same page, which Correct. is 103, but you should actually go to 105. Yes. So, but I, but the one that fails that, um, we will actually see the spring note. Yes. So if that's right, smart enough, it could just actually follow the logical pointer to the 105 and doesn't have to restart from the beginning. If it fails where, when? At 103, like mm -hmm. when you're trying to append something to 103. Let's say insert K7 to 103. 5.5. Okay, yeah, 5.5. I'm yeah. trying to insert K5.5. And compare swap fails. Yes. So someone actually do the splitting. So, so, so you're here. This yeah. has been updated. And yeah. you will see the split node. Um, so you don't have to go back to the root, but you can actually just traverse. Correct. The there, I think there are some optimizations. I don't know whether we do them all, where like if I, if I compare swap fails and I recognize, oh, well, if I come back and read, what am I seeing? Yeah. I could then use that as a way to jump to what I'm looking for. I think we are very conservative, and we don't always do that in the implementation. Yes? So when we're creating 105, we do traverse the delta chain of 103 to see what changes to 5 and k5 and k6 were made? So this question is, when I'm creating, uh, if I'm creating 105, how do I, w would I apply changes? Yes. And I would know, again, you know what you're splitting on. So if it's like delete k4, I ignore it because that's not, not, that's not in mine. But it's like insert k5.5 that should be in mine, then I apply it. Yes? Are the separators split like both at atomically, or is it like we do the split, then we'll add the separator later? This question is, are the split and separator add atomically? Again, I can only do one thing atomically. I can only update one address in the mapping table atomically. It's because it's a latch, it's latch rate. So what if we update page 103 and like we append something to the delta record of page 103, right? But then after that we want to append something to page 105, like insert key 5.5, right? We'd have to read the entire delta record to find the split. For this page here? Yeah. Right, yes. There could be stuff up above. So, like, do we read the entire delta I, I, see, I see your point. Like, yeah. the, the, there could be, like... Or can, it could be, like, delete... It could be insert K... If there's insert 5.5... I think for insert, you always have to go to the base page. So then you would always see the split. Um, I actually think for everything, you always have to go to the base page. Yeah, for delete and insert. You, yeah, so I, it's not like I would blindly append this thing. All right, we're short in time. Um, 
I'm rushing this a bit much, but I, I can answer questions afterwards. So I want to quickly just talk about the R optimization. So again, um, the paper you had you guys read, uh, this was our attempt to write uh, the sort of the, the, the missing guide on how to build a BW tree. So the original BW tree paper from Microsoft doesn't explain a lot of the core things you actually need to actually build a real, real BW tree. There's a bunch of these other papers they, they wrote after the original paper that sort of sprinkle in some of the, the things that are, that are in our paper. And our, so our paper is meant to be a consolidated guide on here, here's how to build a real BW tree. And so when I first started at CMU, I said, all right, we're going to build a new database system. And I was super enamored with the BW tree. And I was like, well, if we ever build a new system, we're going to use a BW tree. The first time I taught this class, the, the second project was implement a BW tree, which was a nightmare, right? Um, but the, the, like I said, the one student, the PhD student that, that was super awesome, we took his BW tree, he kept on working for two years, and that's, that's what this paper was. But this paper was not meant to be like, oh, look how crappy the BW tree was. It was like, you know, we actually wanted the benchmark to see how it actually could perform, and it turns out it was terrible. Um, so that's why it's sort of the split brain. Like half the paper says, here's how to build it, and then the second half paper says why it's bad, right? Because it wasn't supposed to be like that. All right, so I want to quickly talk about some optimizations that we did in our version. So ours is called the Open BW tree. Ours is, is to the best of my knowledge, it's the best open source implementation of the BW tree. There's a couple other ones that are out there, but they don't do all the things that we do. There's one system out of Germany called SLED. Uh, it's like an embedded system that's written in Rust. They're supposedly using a BW tree. I don't know whether they go to the same extent that ours is. Um, the BW tree shows up in other systems at Microsoft. So Cosmos DB, or it used to be Document DB, it's their, it's their version of MongoDB, or, or their cloud database. They, it uses the BW tree in certain cases. Um, but our, ours is the best open source one. All right, so I didn't really talk about what these, how, where we're actually storing these Delta records. Like in, you know, in the, original, the original discussion of, in Microsoft, they just said, oh, they're just sort of, they don't really say where they are. So you could just allocate a bunch of little Delta records on the heap, but that's a bad idea because you'll have fragmentation in memory. So what we do is when we allocate a base page, we have a little extra space in the header of the base page that we can use for storing Delta records. So now uh, all I need to do now is if I'm going to update the, um, if I'm going to add a new Delta record, I just do a compare and swap on, on this thing here, get a new offset, and now I can insert my Delta record here. And then I go back here and do the, the, the compare and swap to have it point to my head of the Delta record, right? So again, I don't need to take latches to acquire the space. And then when this thing gets full, then I do the consolidation. The other thing that, would, that was super important was um, I haven't really described what the mapping table is. In the original version of the BWG paper, it seems to be a hash table. Um, in our implementation, it's just an array. And so you want to allocate an array that could store any possible you know, nodity up to some, some limit. Um, and so the problem, though, is that if you allocate the full array in the very beginning for every single possible nodity you could ever have, then you end up wasting a lot of space because you're allocating memory that you probably don't need. And so I think in the, um, in the, in the current version of the BW tree that we have in our system, the, the mappy table, the max size is, is, a, is 1 million. So I can have 1 million node IDs in my system. And so if we're storing 128 uh, keys per node, I can have up to 128, potentially 128 keys total. It's, it's less than that because we're only storing the things in the, in the leaf nodes. But roughly that's what it is. So to allocate an, an array with 64-bit pointers uh, with 1, 1 million entries is 8 megabytes. So it doesn't seem like a lot, but if you like, load the TPCC database, it, every table has two or three indexes. So for every table, I'm creating three indexes. So eight megabytes starts to add up a lot from actually not storing anything. So in the old version of Peloton, when you first loaded TPCC, the database would grow to be like 256 megs with no data in it, right? So the way we got around this was we just use, we allocate virtual memory. Uh, and this, this is not using anything special, just using the, the constructs you have from the OS. We allocate a chunk of memory and make sure we only use the upper portion of the mapping table uh, when our index is small. So it doesn't actually get backed by physical memory. So although the virtual size can get large, the resident set size is quite, quite small. Because right? it's only when you touch a page in memory does the OS actually back it with physical memory. All right, quickly to finish up. So this is the, this is the, 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 these are the results that were in the original BW tree paper that Microsoft published uh, with Justin and the other people there. And this is when I saw this, I'm like, oh, this is awesome. We totally want to build a latch-free index here at CMU. So what are they comparing against? So it's their version of BW tree against the skip list and then the, a B plus tree. But this B plus tree is actually from Berkeley DB. Berkeley DB came out of um, UC Berkeley 
uh, it was, it's an embedded uh, database that has, you know, basically like LevelDB or RocksDB, but like one of the first ones to do this. And Oracle bought it in, in like 2006. So they extracted out the source code for the bbus tree from, from BerkeleyDB, and they modified it so it, it didn't actually store anything on disk. So this, this shows that the, um, the BWT tree crushes everything, right? So when I saw this, like, this is amazing, we should totally do this. But then when you actually implement it, so these are our results, uh, <laughs> this is the best, you know, this is our best version of, of the OpenBW tree. This is actually the, the state-of-the-art implementation of the skip list, right? It's out of, um, in, from uh, Alan Fecky's group in Australia. Instead of using towers, it uses wheels, which it's some minor change, whatever. Um, and then this is a B plus tree written by one of the authors from Hyper who came and visited us for a couple months. And this is like his, this is one of the, the, the data structures they used in, in Hyper for their comparisons. So as you can see, the B plus tree crushes, except for this one here, this might be wrong. I, let me touch this. But the B plus tree pretty much crushes everything, right? So then when you look at other data structures, which we'll, we'll talk about next class, right? Then you see the open media tree gets, 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 gets wiped away. So I'm now going to bring in the mass tree and art index. Art index is what you read on, on Wednesday's class. It's a radix tree or try uh, from Hyper. And then the mass tree is out of Harvard. This is a tree of tries, which we'll cover next class. So again, in this environment, the, the BW tree just loses to everything. So this is why we need to get rid of it. But we, just have, we haven't started it yet. OK? Okay, that was like super rushed at the end. I apologize. Um, any questions? All right, so next class, I'll spend more time talking about latches for B, B plus trees. Then we'll talk about the radix tree stuff. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, what you can do for project one. Okay? All right, guys, see ya. Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit because I ain't with that beer called the OE because I'm OG. I a little more kick hook like a fish after just one sip Yo. put it to my lips and rip the top off eight ball just dropped up this ain't eyes hopped off and my hood won't be the same after ice cube take a say eye to the brain yeah.